Hello. Hello. Paul. Hello, Paul. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Good morning to so all of you here at St. Andrew St. Stephen's. For those of you that are online via Zoom, good morning. Welcome to worship here uh, in this place. Uh, what I, I hope you've had a great week. It's been uh, two weeks of spring break. And I've got to be honest, you know, when I see two weeks of spring break coming up, I'm always a bit nervous about it. Like, what am I going to do with the girls for two weeks? And it's at the end. So it's like, this is the best day ever because they go back to school tomorrow. Uh, so it's been a great two weeks. But actually, uh, being really honest, uh, spring break has been fabulous, because the end of it, on Friday for me, I had the privilege of officiating at a wedding. We had a private ceremony on January the 22nd of this year for Emily Jennings and Ben Crease, uh, uh, Emily, daughter of David and Laura Jennings, uh, because that date was really important to them. But they set up uh, their actual wedding with family and friends around them for this past Friday, not knowing if COVID restrictions would allow them. But we got to do it at a, a wonderful location in downtown Vancouver. And it was brilliant. Um, not because I was officiating <laughs> at, the, at the wedding, but it was just brilliant to be in a gathering again and actually feel normal. And that sense of normality actually got heightened a little bit when I was sitting at the dinner uh, with Ross and Laura Lockhart. And Ross at one point, you know, he always has that, those little phrases that he says. And he just leaned over and he said, wasn't it lovely, isn't it lovely to be at an actual Christian wedding? You know, and it was like, and it was just this pause and breath after. And it was like, yes. And this, we started to talk a little bit more about it, about being able to actually gather with a young couple and pray God's blessing over them. And uh, yeah, I will make mention David's speech at the end just was phenomenal um, to speak the way he did over his daughter and his new, his new son-in-law to just encourage them and bless them that God had called them together and was going to just continue to pour out his life upon them. It was such a blessing. Um, it was such a highlight at the end of spring break. And at the, at the service, um, I highlighted the fact that the other-centered, the other-centered hyphenated uh, love of God is the very womb of the universe. Life is nurtured for all of us. For all of creation, life on this earth is nurtured out of that other-centered love of God. So think of it like this. Life is nurtured in us because the living God's love for us means that He wants to. He's yearning daily, 24 hours, seven days a week. He wants nothing more than to pour his life into you, into us, into me. 
that's why we're here. What a privilege it is. We gather for worship every Sunday. I wonder do we actually wake up on a Sunday morning and really think, what does this mean? Why is this morning different from every other morning of the week? Why is this moment in this week different for us right now? Because you're coming and you're listening to somebody preach, or you're thinking who's going to be in the praise team this morning, or who's going to be wearing the nicest dress this morning. No. It's because the living God has called us to himself, and his desire this morning is to meet with us in this time, this place, and breathe his life, his love into us to fill us to overflowing. What a privilege. What a joy. That's normal. That's what it means to be a worshiping community. So it's great to be together this morning. And without further ado, let's light those candles for those of you in your worship spaces at home. For us here this morning, we're going to light that candle. It's that visible sign that we are in the presence of the living God. Let's worship together. Let's pray. Let's join together in prayer. Father God, to begin this service with that word, Father, should just fill us with life right there. Because we know to be a parent is about pouring out love and life on children. <laughs> That's our job. That's our deepest yearning. It just comes naturally because that's the way you created us to be, because that's who you are. You are our Father. You want to pour your life out on every single one of us gathered this morning, whether it be in this place or whether it be in worship places, at homes. We thank you for the opportunity we have of being here this morning, gathering in your name, gathering to proclaim that we believe in you, that we want to commit our lives to you, that we want to come before you and say, Lord, we need your life in us. We are fallen creatures, but we know that you are the loving parent that wants to lift us up, renew us, reconcile us, reform us, remake us into the people that you created us to be. Thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have to gather week after week. And we pray this morning that whatever happens in this place, every single one of us would indeed have an encounter, a realization of who we are, where we are, whose we are right now. Lord, meet with us in this place. For some, we come in after exciting a uh, couple of weeks of spring break. For others, they might come into this place and they're dealing with a lot of difficulties, stresses, strains, worries, doubts, fears. So we come from different walks of life, we head out these doors at the end of the service back into those different walks of life. Yet now, in this place, we get to be met by you. So wherever we are, whoever we're dealing with, we pray that you would indeed meet us in this moment, that you would speak the words that we need to hear. For those that need to be lifted, we trust that you will do exactly that. You will gather those up into your arms of love, that you will pour out your amazing grace on every single one gathered in your name in this place. Lord God, it was indeed a privilege this week to pray over a wonderful couple committing their lives to each other before you, before their family, before their friends. 
reminds me it's a privilege to stand here every Sunday and pray a blessing over this gathering, trusting that you would indeed hear that prayer, that you would respond to that prayer, that you, your desire is to pour out that life. So Lord, bless us this day as we gather, and we gather because of you, not because of us. Pour out your amazing grace right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, who taught us as a family to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As Pastor Martin has reminded us, it is because of love that we have life. Our first songs this morning remind us of that amazing grace, God's grace that Jesus should take our sin, should take on death, that we may have life both today and for eternity. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace and then Because He Lives.
kids, and I would invite the kids. I think you're going to head downstairs with Berlin and Jane to begin with. So the kids are heading downstairs, and I'm going to invite Pam to come forward, and she's going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see you today. Today we are going to do a response prayer. So when I said, say, generous God, you will respond, pour out your love. Let's pray. Almighty God, in this season of Lent, we are reminded of, your, of our own difficulties and struggles. Thank you that you remain constant with us through all the changing scenes of life. Help us to trust you in times of joy and in sorrow. Be our shepherd in the darkness and in the light so that we might be living examples of hopes for others. Generous God, pour out your love. Oh Lord, we come to you at this time of great shock and grief for the 132 people who lost their lives on their plane accident in China. We ask that you, that in your grace, you would give your peace and comfort to all the families who are mourning. Pour your hope that passes all understanding into the hearts of all that are grieving and shower the assurance of your love at this time of sadness. Generous God, pour out your love. God of hope, we pray to you when hope is scarce, as our world shakes with the horror of war. You alone know the extent of the crimes committed in Ukraine. The people murdered, the homes and buildings destroyed, the families forced to be apart, people leaving their country, and so much more. We ask, we ask you to give wisdom to the world leaders as they impose sanctions, looking for diplomatic and economic ways to end this aggression. Protect the people of Ukraine who are stumbling from the trauma of the invasion. Open the arms of nearby countries to take in refugees. Open the eyes of President Putin to see the damage that this war is causing. Help us believe that justice will prevail and that peace can be found. Generous God, pour out your love. Heavenly Father, we confess our need for you today. We need your healing and your grace. We need hope restored. We need to be reminded that your work, that you work on behalf of those you love constantly, powerfully, completely. We come to you and bring you the places we are hurting. You see where no one else is able to fully see or understand. You know the pain we've carried, the burdens, the cares. You know where we need to be set free. We ask for your healing and grace to cover every broken place, every wound, every heartache. We name our brothers and sisters that are struggling with their health. Una Wood, Louise Renard, Janice Darlington, Helen Arnett, Ron Edwards, Liz Lilly, Lauren Dennis, Kel Kaiser, Penny McDonald. We also remember the elderly of our community of faith that are living in a senior facility. Margaret Williams, Don Campbell, Alan Bone, Joanne Graham, and Dean Scott. We reach out to you and know that you are restoring and redeeming every place of difficulty, every battle for your greater glory. Generous God, pour out your love. 
Lord of all, you made the earth and saw that it was good. Now the earth cries out and your people are hungry and thirsty. Open our eyes to see the pain of your creation and move us with compassion for your world. Lead us to act as neighbors so that together we may care for all that you have made with all creation. Please give us hearts of compassion like yours and help us to be alert to those in need of your transforming love. Help us to be ready to be changed ourselves and we as we reach out to others. Show us ways to restore our relationships, our community, and our world. Generous God, pour out your love. In your mercy, fill us with your spirit. Hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. We have a God of relationship who loves to touch us through worship, through prayer, through word. As we sing this next hymn, he touched me. May I ask you to reflect what areas of your life is God touching you? Or maybe what areas of your life are you not allowing him to touch you? Please stand and join us with he touched me. Bible reading today is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 52. The request of James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. How can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, 
you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Blind Bartimaeus. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said to him, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Here ends the lesson. Good morning. So we're going to hear from um, Handel's Messiah the parent where uh, the soprano and then the gentleman, I don't know what voice he does, but he's like, ooh, very nice. You like that? Um, they sing uh, from the prophet Zechariah and then Isaiah.
shall the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an horse and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. So today I I'm loud, but I'm not that loud. So today, today we just watched uh, part one, uh, the 18 and 19 movement. So I took you back to part one today. The section 19 of Handel's Messiah intends to reflect the words of Isaiah 35. And you can see them, please, Owen, on the screen. Then will the eyes of the blind be open, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue should shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. I love the joy in the beginning. Martin was telling me, look at her face, like, rejoice. Are you rejoicing? Rejoice, rejoice. And I think the lyrics are a good reflection of the hope that, I, that Isaiah is talking about. The hope that God is offering to Israel. And even on the driest desert, and I, I had the privilege to be there, with some people from this church. That desert is very, very dry. We'll blossom with flowers because God, because God is coming. God is coming. So if you are skeptical 2,000 years ago and you might ask, how is this going to happen? How are we going to know? And Isaiah answers, remember God's mighty deeds in the Exodus? you will see them again. Remember when God showed his power liberating Israel. He will do it again. So many, many years later, maybe 600 years later, Mark Gospel begins his account of Jesus' life with these words. Please, Owen. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written where? Of course, in Isaiah. That's the prophet at the time of Jesus, the most popular prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight path for him. Hear that word, way, way, way. Very important. That's why today when you walk into the sanctuary, uh, when, you, when you walk into the sanctuary, you saw this footstep. Who messed up with my footsteps in there? They're supposed to be coming here, all right? But they're supposed to be coming here, leading to the cross, leading us to Jerusalem. So this is the good news that Mark offers. Rejoice, by the way. Many people think Matthew was the first gospel written. It was Mark, the first gospel written. There's no time to talk about that. Maybe you can invite me for a coffee or hot chocolate, and I'll tell you. That will be a long meeting, by the way. <laughs> this is good news. Rejoice. From the very beginning, Mark gospel shows that Jesus is the one who Isaiah announced. Jesus begins preaching the kingdom of God is here, calling people, disciples, to follow him and performing these amazing miracles. Remember, Mark is very short, so it goes boom, boom, boom. Jesus doing miracles all over the place in the first part of the gospel, healing the sea, calming the storm, raising the dead. As you read this amazing account of Jesus' story, I can hear her singing, rejoice. Hey, how was that, Nicola? Pretty good, huh? 
Amazing. Very good, actually. Rejoice, rejoice. God is coming. He's right here, right now. So the first section of the Gospel of Mark shows the Jesus doing this amazing thing. But there is something interesting. There is a question lingering as Mark is telling us all these amazing things that Jesus is doing. The question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Thank you, Owen. <laughs> who is Jesus? The Pharisees ask, who is this man? He's forgiving sins? Forgives sins? Who does he think he is? A demon confesses. And this is the first miracle of Jesus in Mark. Pretty amazing. I know who you are. The Holy One of God. The disciples then said themselves, ask. After Jesus, Jesus calms the storm. Remember that story? You all know it very well. What I love about that story is that they are more scared of Jesus than scared of the storm. Who is this? The wind and the sea obey him. So Mark is telling us this. Living this question. Telling us the story of Jesus. So you and us, you and I, we, we would ask this question. Who is Jesus? And the other question that he intends to answer, and maybe you click the next uh, or when maybe the question will appear. Oh, look at that. That's very fancy. Thank you, Owen. What does it mean to be his disciple? What does it mean to be his disciple? And right in the middle of the gospel, at the very heart of the narrative, we find something called the way section. So the idea of the aisle with these footsteps is to intend to show this way section in the Gospel of Mark. And our reading today is at the very end of this way section in the Gospel. So who is Jesus? The answer to this very important question is presented in the way section. In the middle of Mark's narrative, we answer we find the answer to this question. Who is this Jesus? And if we go to the next slide, please. We find this question. Then Jesus takes over and he says, OK, let's talk about this. Who do people say I am? And the disciples give their answer. Some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah, a prophet. And then there is the important question, the personal question. All right, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? So the way section begins. And in the next slide, there are two things that are very important in this way section. Maybe we need to click one more time. There you go. Thank you. So the way section begins at the very beginning of the section in chapter 8. So imagine you are there, back there in Galilee. And there is a blind man in the beginning of this way section. And at the end of the way section, right before arriving to Jerusalem, we find another blind man. So you might ask, OK, how many blind people healed Jesus? Maybe many. But Mark tells us about two. One in the beginning of his journey to Jerusalem, his way to Jerusalem, and one at the end of his way to Jerusalem. So the way section, I love this. We studied this in our Thursday Bible study a few years ago. We took a few weeks to walk through here. Don't worry, you're going to go home today before Tuesday. <laughs> Not today, actually, if it's Tuesday. So you find this word way repeated over and over and over in this section. Seven times. The Greek word is chodos. Can you say that? Chodos. 
codos, very good. I like your codos, codos, several times. Regretfully, when you read a translation that is very dynamic like the NIV, the translator tends to change the word in the translation several times, probably to keep the text interesting, but it misses the, the emphasis, the translation. So you find this word repeated several times. So what is this place? This is a symbolic place. Why? The hodos, the way, is the place to follow Jesus. It's a place to listen to his word. It's a place to learn what it means to be his disciple. It's the place to learn what kind of Messiah, what kind of king Jesus is. And remember, in Acts, the first description, the first story of the first Christians, Christians are called the people of the way. So in the beginning, we, we, we have this blind person in Bethesda. And it's a very interesting story. So Jesus touched him. And that would be enough, right? So Jesus asked him, uh, do you see? And he's like, so-so. Uh, I see people like trees walking around. So Jesus again touches him. For the second time, he seems to be a stubborn, blind person. And then his eyes were opened. And immediately after, we find this story where Jesus talks with his disciple, okay, who do you think I am? Who do you say I am? And if we go to the next slide, please. Maybe one more click, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I work in a Mac, so then we pass it to a, a Microsoft computer and this, this sort of thing happens. So what is interesting about the way section, and remember, we're walking from Galilee to Jerusalem, is that Jesus announces, predicts, he tells his disciples, you know, I am going to the cross. And he does that three times. So in the beginning of the section, he starts telling them, the Son of Man needs to be crucified. But don't worry, he will raise from the dead. Then a second time, as he goes advancing to Jerusalem, then a third time, and as you read the narrative, and as you are walking to Jerusalem, to the cross, you wonder, uh, are these people getting it? Are they understanding? What is going on? The first announcement comes right after that question. Who do you say I am? And Peter goes, you are the Messiah. And most of us almost want to go to Matthew when Jesus says, good job, Peter. Good job, man. We find none of that in Mark. When Peter answers, you are the Messiah, Mark says this, Jesus warned them to not tell anybody about this. And then what happens? He starts talking. The Son of Man must suffer. He must be killed. And after three days, he will rise again. Do you remember Peter's reaction? He says, no way, Jose. You're going to die? What kind of Messiah are you? You know, uh, here in Israel, we like Messiahs who don't get killed. We like Messiahs who win battles. Powerful kings like King David. So are you the son of David? What are you talking about with this cross thing? So they don't get it. First announcement. The second prediction comes in the middle of this way section. And Jesus again. 931. The son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And right after Jesus said that, which is very interesting in the narrative, please don't miss that. This happens right after. Jesus look at them, and they're fighting each other. And Jesus is like, uh, okay, children, what are you fighting about? 
And I can see my two children looking at me if we ask. They're like, nothing. <laughs> That's the answer they give Jesus. But Mark tells us they don't want to tell Jesus because they were fighting about who is the greatest. Who will be the greatest? And Jesus is like, oh boy, you're not getting it, do you? Second time. The third and the last passion prediction happens right before the text that Nicola read today. And why I'm doing this big context? Because in a narrative, it's very, very important to understand the context. Where is the narrative going? So we get this very, very important sense of the dramatic moment that Mark is taking us to see. Mark 10, 32. They were on their way. They were in the hodos, remember this word? Up to Jerusalem, thank you, Owen up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, with Jesus going before. That's the sense of the, of the Greek word. Jesus is leading, is going in front of them, so they need to follow him. And the disciples were astonished. Some were afraid. So again, very important in the narrative. Again, so Mark is telling us, uh, guys, uh, we've done this before. You heard the expression, the third is the charm, right? Well, not always. Again, he took the 12 aside, and he told them what was going to happen to him. He's going to die, but he will rise again. And right there, we find our text today. The disciples answer to that third announcement. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's a child question. I get that question from Felipe. Dad, can you do uh, something for me? I'm not going to tell you what, but can you? Can you say yes? <laughs> That's a children's question. And Jesus replies, what do you want me to do for you? Don't forget that question, because word by word, that question is very significant. What do you want me to do for you? And they ask, let one of us sit at your right and the other one at your left in your glory. Right before this, you, there is a Greek word then, the Greek word de, that means that it happens immediately after Jesus told them that he was going to die on the cross for the third time. And this is the answer. Jesus is like, I'm going to die on the cross. And they are like, can we share the throne with you? Maybe sit next to you so everyone can see that we are the favorites, that we are great like you. And Jesus tells them, listen, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I don't think you understand what kind of Messiah I am. What is interesting in the story is that we began over there with a blind man who, co who cannot see. Jesus is like, one, twice, can you see now? Yes. So these disciples are like this blind person. The funny part is the blind person was touched twice and done. The disciples have been told three times and it's not working. But don't miss the drama of this. As you read the text, like where you, like if you were reading it for the first time, you see that they're approaching Jerusalem. They're coming to the cross. And right here before entering Jerusalem, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. 
Jesus' last week is about to begin. At this point in the narrative, we might ask, is there anyone who understands Jesus? Who is he? What is his mission? What kind of Messiah? Is there anyone who is able to see what's going on? And Jesus told the disciples in chapter 8, a few chapters before, do you still not perceive or understand? Do you have eyes and fail to see? So seeing in the gospel is this metaphor for understanding, for seeing Jesus, for who he is, and what he has come to do. So because of its symbolic value, its number, and its significance, twice, right? Two blind men healed at the beginning of the way, at the end of the way section. The healing of blind people plays a crucial role in this narrative. In particular in Mark, the Markan narrative portrays the faculty of sight as a metaphor for knowing and understanding who is Jesus and what does it mean to be his disciples. So we find Bartimaeus after the failure of the disciples. And I love this story. I was telling this morning as we were praying, I have told this story at Camp Douglas and around. And welcome to camp. So we find blind Bartimaeus sitting, paraten hodon in Greek, next to the road. He's sitting. He's sitting in there. He is blind, but he knows somehow Jesus is coming. He knows. He knows maybe that this is the one shot he has to change his life. By the way, when I teach people, young people at camp, I, I, I try once to tell them, okay, as I tell you this part of the story, please close your eyes. And they cannot have their eye closed closed for three minutes. Can I do it? And I'm like, why you cannot do it? No, I get anxious. Not even three minutes? I have a friend, Josue Fonseca, one of my mentors in Chile. He got an eye um, surgery, and he had to be in a dark room uh, for three days, eyes closed. He told me he was going crazy. Can you imagine? having your eyes closed for three days? What about three years? What about 30 years? And you hear stories of this amazing, powerful rabbi, and he's coming your way because we are so lucky to live in Jericho right before Jesus enter, enters Jerusalem. So he starts screaming, of course. Wouldn't you? So get ready. There will be screaming. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you are familiar with the biblical language, he's basically saying, Jesus, Messiah, have mercy on me. And people are like, shh, shut up. So he goes louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus hears him. Jesus hears him. Tell him to come. And as he's getting up, he has his himantion in Greek. This. And I'm sorry, I didn't have a better one. And I can't, we have some costumes. We were, our costumes were put away. But this is a himantion. They, they use it to hear or hear, you know, to look pretty. They use it. But a blind person, the scholar says, they would use to put it they, they would put it on the ground to collect money from people, you know, arms. Look at what Mars says. As he's getting up, he has his himantion with him. He's coming to meet Jesus. And here is another sign of the kind of person he is. He's a beggar. He has no life but asks for money. Maybe he has money in here, I don't know. But what powerful thing Mars says 
as he throws this away. I really dislike the NIV translation because he translates this word as balo. Balo means to throw or to drop. But Mark uses a different word, kind of. He uses apo balo, and apo is a preposition to say far. So as he's getting up to meet Jesus, he has this that represents his whole life. So he's coming to meet Jesus, so he throws it away to meet Jesus. Because he knows this is it. At that point, when he does that, he's already becoming a disciple. So he comes to meet Jesus. And Jesus asks him one question. One question. A life-changing question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Do you remember that question? Jesus asked that question before. To a bunch of spoiled disciples. Oh, we want to sit at your right and your left. What is... Bartimaeus answer. Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. And don't miss this. Mark says, immediately. And if you read a good literal translation of Mark, you hear this word over and over and over. And immediately. And immediately. So again, and immediately, he received his sight. And he followed Jesus on the hodos, on the way. He followed him. So the blind man, the beggar, is not a blind beggar anymore. He's now a disciple following Jesus with eyes open, heart open to what Jesus is doing to what Jesus is saying. So Bartimaeus faith in Jesus and his willingness to have an open heart and just to ask, I want to see, defines him as a disciple. Bartimaeus is not a beggar anymore. Now he's a disciple. And a follower with open eyes that has joined Jesus' way to the cross. Kind of funny, kind of sad part, any Markan scholar would say, the disciples are not getting it at this point. That's the drama of the story. Hey, they don't until after the resurrection. And we can look at them and say, oh, they're so silly, right? They don't get it. They are selfish, thinking about themselves. They're not following Jesus. How come they don't see that? Jesus is right there with them, right? Aren't we the same? Aren't I the same? Sometimes, maybe, sometimes too often. This story is written for us. So we also understand so we also are aware that we need to have eyes open to follow Jesus but they will learn the angel will tell the women later he's going ahead of you into Galilee just as he told you there there you will see him there you will see him so I think this way section in Mark, this story of Bartimaeus, is an excellent story to reflect during this, during this Lenten season. What do you want me to do for you? What would you say? What would I say? Whatever we say, it will reveal the state of our heart. 
and we know after two years of pandemic and social isolation and being away, maybe we need our vision to be restored again, to remember what it means to be a disciple. I need that. To get our feet back on track to follow Jesus. Maybe we need to start moving again because Jesus never calls us to be sitting in our comfort zone. No. This story is telling us what Lent is really about. It's getting ready. It's preparing ourselves to follow Jesus to the cross with open eyes and open hearts, with willingness, with a disposition to be formed, reform. See what I did that with our form church? Transformed by the touch of the Messiah. The difficult lesson to learn in this story is that we may spend a lot, a lot, a lot of time with Jesus, around Jesus' community, but still be blinded. The disciples' feet were on the road. You see, their feet. I got new shoes. Their feet were on the road, but their hearts, their hearts were not on Jesus' way. We might say today, oh, we are not blind. Yeah, you're right, maybe. Maybe we can see very well. But we all have blind spots. That's when you're turning right, turning left, you're taught to do a shoulder check. Because we do have blind spots. We live in the most beautiful country on earth, the best country to live in. And believe me, I'm from Chile, and I've been in other countries, and I work with immigrants that come from many, many different countries. Believe me, I mean that. I do mean that. So I have privilege. I am very comfortable. I live in a beautiful place, drive a nice car, have the best family. But that can be blinding. I need to learn from this story that Eugene Peterson, Eugene Peterson, professor, professor at Regent College for many years. <clears throat> Some poor, poor people go to Regent, right, Martin? He says this in a beautiful book called The Jesus Way. To follow Jesus implies that we enter into a way of life that is given character and shape and direction by the one who calls us. To follow Jesus means that we cannot separate what Jesus is saying from what Jesus is doing and the way in which he is doing it. To follow Jesus, Peterson says, is as much or maybe even more about fit as it is about ears and eyes. about feet, about following him on the way. So the Messiah questions remain for this Lenten season. As we come, as we are approaching week by week, day by day, to Jerusalem, and we stand in front of the cross on Good Friday, Listen to this question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Amen. Horatio Spafford wrote the next hymn we're going to sing called It Is Well With My Soul whilst on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He had found himself in utter grief and tragedy and yet 
because he's a disciple of Jesus, he's able to say it as well with my soul. He knew that his soul was held by a God who has eternal perspective, as we have just heard from Daniel. We are on a way, on a journey with Jesus, and it is well with our souls. The refrain in this hymn has a beautiful harmony part, so we have recruited some voices. If you know your choral line, sing it. And if you don't, just sing, because this hymn is amazing truth. Let's stand and sing, It Is Well With My Soul. Open eyes and open hearts to follow him this Lent. 